guys, welcome back to my channel for the fourth installment of my Harry Potter and Classics series, which means in today's episode we're going to be talking all about Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, the fourth book in J.K. Rowling's original Harry Potter series. If you haven't seen one of these videos before, then I will obviously direct you to the introduction video and episode one. But in brief, I am both a massive Harry Potter fan and a classicist slash ancient historian currently conducting their PhD. And one of the things that I am very aware of when reading and rereading the Harry Potter books is all of the references to characters from Greek and Roman myth as well as figures from Greek and Roman history. And in each of these videos I take you through one of the original seven books and tell you all about the different characters and creatures that crop up in that book that are inspired by antiquity and tell you a little bit more about the myths and historical stories behind them. Now you don't have to be a massive Harry Potter fan to watch these videos because they are all about introducing you to ancient history and classical mythology but warnings there may be small spoilers here and there. Naturally I would recommend checking out the previous three videos in the series but you can watch them independently so do stick around for this one first. So something I can already say to you before getting into the figures in this video is that it is a very heavy on the monsters and creatures episode. A lot of you magical creatures are introduced in the fourth Harry Potter book, whether that be because of the Triwizard Tournament or Care of Magical Creatures, they are cropping up everywhere and a lot, a lot, a lot of the creatures from J.K. Rowling's series are um, taken or adapted from classical mythology. Now one of these which is particularly explicit is the Sphinx. So we meet the Sphinx in the fourth Harry Potter book during the final of the three Triwizard tasks that Harry has to compete at at school. In this task he has to travel for a maze in order to claim the Triwizard Cup and get past a series of magical curses, jinxes, spells and creatures that may get in his way one of which is the Sphinx. Now J.K. Rowling stayed pretty true to the original myth in this case in that the Sphinx is a riddle teller. In order to get past the Sphinx and uh, not be instead eaten by the Sphinx, Harry has to solve a riddle. Now in Greek mythology the Sphinx is a magical creature with the body of a lion and the head of a human, occasionally with the addition of wings. And just like in Harry Potter, those that cannot answer the Sphinx's riddles are destined to be eaten by the Sphinx. The Sphinx is actually a major part of the Oedipus myth. In this myth Oedipus is the son of Queen Jocasta of Thebes. However he is uh, given away as a baby because of a prophecy that says he will kill his father and marry his mother. Naturally his parents are not into that so they get rid of him but it's almost impossible to avoid the fate of a prophecy in Greek mythology and Oedipus eventually travels to Thebes unaware that this is his original homeland and that these are his parents mistakenly kills his father, the king, and marries the king's widow, Jocasta, also his mother. Now, it takes many years before both characters discover that they are actually related to one another and they have already had four children. Now, during his travel to Thebes, Oedipus comes across a sphinx which is guarding the city and has to answer the sphinx's riddle. Now, the riddle in Harry Potter is not the same as the riddle from the myth that becomes more popular um, in the sort of classical period of Greek mythology. In Harry Potter, of course, the riddle is all about a spider, whereas in mythology, the riddle is usually uh, depicted as being what creature has four legs then two legs and three legs and Oedipus guesses right by answering man who crawls as a baby is walks on two legs as a man and then when he is older has a walking stick aka three legs um, and you can read about this in Apollodorus's library of Greek mythology. Now like in Harry Potter the Sphinx in the Oedipus myth has the face of a woman but of course you're probably also familiar from the Sphinxes depicted in Egyptian architecture. Now the Sphinx in Egyptian myth is much more commonly associated with um, the male face so um, the most famous Sphinx of course that has the face of a man and it's at this point where it's worth mentioning that the Sphinx is certainly not a creature um, solely associated with Greek myth. It is a creature that crops up in different forms in various different cultures mythology but as these videos are all about Harry Potter and the classics I've decided to focus on the riddle telling sphinx of Greek mythology. If you would like to read more about the Oedipus myths we have three plays surviving from the playwright Sophocles um, following the characters of this myth Antigone, Oedipus Rex and Oedipus at Colonus. There is of course also Apollodorus's uh, library of Greek mythology that as I already mentioned includes the riddle of the sphinx. Next 
Next up is two creatures, however, because I feel like they both draw elements from one particular creature from Greek mythology, and those are the Mer people and the Vila. Both of these magical creatures we encounter for the first time in the Goblet of Fire. The Vila we meet during the Quidditch World Cup as representatives or cheerleaders almost for the Bulgarian Quidditch team, and the Mer people we meet during the second task of the Triwizard Tournament where Harry has to go into the lake in order to retrieve his friend Ron Weasley. Now the creature that I associate with these Mer people and with the Vila are sirens, and that's because of the um, sort of attractive nature of the villa that draws men to them and the like eerily beautiful voices of the Mer people. Sirens were creatures from Greek mythology who lulled sailors to their deaths by using their beautiful singing voices. They kind of hypnotized sailors with these with these songs and they would sail into rocky outcrops that would be the end of them and their crew. One of the most famous incidents involving the sirens in Greek mythology is that involving Odysseus from Homer's Odyssey. So during Odysseus his travels back from the Trojan War as he was one of the Greek soldiers that served um, on the Greek side of the army. It takes him a very long time to get home because of various different adventures he gets embroiled in. One of these is the encounter with the sirens. Now Odysseus has been pre-warned that the sirens are coming up and that he needs to prepare himself and his crew in order to escape them. Now Odysseus orders his men to stuff their ears with beeswax so that they won't be drawn in by the song of the sirens but he asks them to tie him to the mast rather than stuffing his ears and no matter how much he begs to be let loose and to go to the sirens not to let him go. In that way Odysseus allows himself to be the only man that ever hears a siren song and survives or one of the only men because there is also Orpheus who we meet in uh, Apollonius of Rhodes' Argonautica. Orpheus is one of the most well-renowned musicians of classical mythology. He was meant to be an incredible um, singer and lyre player and when he and his fellow sailors are passing by the sirens in the Argonautica, he plays his instrument to drown out the songs of the sirens and prevent them tempting any of his fellow crew members. Now I guess in this sense they aren't actually hearing the sirens in that instance either, although it's a slightly different technique from what Odysseus used. Generally speaking, sirens are depicted as combinations of female figures and birds. Over time there has been more emphasis on the uh, human female aspect of their look, um, but but in some of the older depictions they have the heads of birds, not just wings. But I have one more magical creature to mention to you before I get on to a character that we haven't talked about yet. And for this I want to mention the Abraxan horses. So the Abraxan horses in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire are the horses which draw the magical flying carriage used by um, the headmistress and students of Beaubaton, the French wizarding school, when they um, journey to Hogwarts for the Triwizard Tournament. Now flying horses are certainly something that we see in Greek mythology if we think of Pegasus, the companion of Hercules. Pegasus is probably the most infamous flying horse of mythology and, and he was actually a product of the murder of Medusa. So Medusa was a um, woman who was turned into a gorgon, a beast that turned men to stone by looking at them and who had snakes for hair. Now the Greek hero Perseus slays Medusa by cutting off her head and when he cuts off her head that is the birth of her children and one of these children is Pegasus. So you can actually see this depicted in some stone sculptures in which um, the severed neck of Medusa is giving way to uh, this flying horse. It's certainly not quite as cute an image as uh, the Pegasus from Disney's Hercules where Zeus creates him out of fluffy clouds, but there you go. <laughs> Now thanks to popular culture we associate Pegasus with Hercules, but he actually assists Bellerophon to slay the Chimera in Greek mythology, which is a story recounted to us in the myths collected by Pindar. But I did promise you a character as well that wasn't a magical creature, well she is a witch, but that is Narcissa Malfoy. So Narcissa Malfoy, as you're probably aware, is the mother of Draco Malfoy and the wife of Lucius Malfoy, as well as the sister to Bellatrix Lestrange. I mean all of the Purebloods families as we know are somehow related to one another. We first properly meet her in the Harry Potter series when she and her son and husband join Harry and the Weasleys in their box to view the Quidditch world 
spelled cup. Her name, however, is taken from the Greek mythological figure Narcissus. Narcissus was actually a man from Greek mythology who was incredibly proud, haughty, perhaps a little bit comparable to Narcissa, and beautiful. His beauty was particularly famed and this made him less inclined to marry others that he felt were beneath him and his name is of course the origin of the word narcissism because instead of falling in love with somebody else, he falls in love with himself. Now how this happens is that a nymph sees him in the woods and she falls in love with his beauty. This nymph went by the name of Echo and like with everybody else that Narcissus had encountered, he rejects her advances. Instead, he gazes upon his own reflection in a pool of water and falls in love with it, not realizing that it is himself. After some time staring at his own reflection, however, falling deeply in love, he does figure out, he figures out that this is him and he realizes that he will never be able to find somebody as beautiful as him to marry and dies of grief. Pretty tragic, but many Greek and Roman myths are and I'm sure you will know that if you've watched a few of these videos already, prepare for tragedy if you haven't watched the past three episodes, but I would encourage you to do so if you have enjoyed this episode. I will hopefully be getting around to filming the Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix installment of this series in the next month or so. I know it's usually a while between these videos, but they do take a little bit of research and time to um, get to. If you are interested in learning a little bit more about ancient history or classical mythology, then I do have an entire playlist of videos that I will link down below, as well as a podcast that I run called That's Ancient History, which is full of interesting information about ancient history and classical mythology, if I do say so myself. It's not always me. There's often guests on it providing the interesting information. Um, but I do hope you've enjoyed this video. I would love to hear from you in the comments down below if you did. And until next time, happy reading. I'll see you all again soon. Bye, guys.